Okay guys, today we are going to learn a little bit about John Smith and hopefully you've done your reading and I encourage you to have some notes out and have your book out as well. I'm going to point out some important quotes um, from the work. But first I'm just going to give you a little bio on John Smith. Hopefully you also read that part, but let me just kind of pull out the important elements that you need to remember about him. Um, I really give you the dates for context. You don't have to memorize the dates, but there they are. He lived from 1580 to 1631, and he was born to a farming family in England, a very uh, humble background, and as a teenager, he found that to be a little boring and quiet, so after his father died, he just left home and decided to go out adventuring. And he pursued a military career, really. He fought um, privateer as a privateer, which really just means he was a paid. He was paid by other countries to um, either be in a leadership position or just to fight in their army. So he fought in several different um, wars. I'll read you this one little section from, the, from your book. It says, while fighting the Ottomans in Hungary, Smith earned promotion to the captain's rank that became an enduring part of his public persona. He claimed, apparently, with at least some degree of truth, that he had defeated and beheaded a succession of three Turkish officers in single combat. So that just gives you a little taste of his personality. He was just an adventurer. He was a really um, assertive personality. I can't think of another one to say it. So eventually, all this experience made him an ideal candidate um, to lead the Jamestown expedition to the New World. And so the Virginia Company sought him out and asked him to go along, and obviously they paid him for that. And so he went, and that's what brought him to the New World. And therein we have the, um, the history of, the general history of Virginia that he's left for us. And so... Um, the most, the thing he's most famous for, and you may laugh a little bit at the the picture I have is is uh, from the movie Pocahontas, is that um, this is really the event that most people remember about John Smith, and it's probably not true. To be perfectly honest, if you do research on it, most people claim that 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 was very unlikely in Native American culture. First of all, that Powhatan would have listened to Pocahontas, and second of all, that she would have even done it. Um, and there really was no uh, romantic element between them, despite what Disney wants us to think. But it is definitely something that made him a notable character in history. All right, so let's look at the general history of Virginia. And so Smith just spent some time describing their first months in America, and um, it didn't go well. They were really sick. They had no food. Um, you know, it was just... It was just pretty rough. What I like about his narrative is he does use some humor here, um, which I think is funny. So if you look at page 113, where it starts, about six lines in, he talks about, you know, when the, when the ships departed and left them there. When they departed, there remained neither tavern, beer house, nor place of relief, but the common kettle. Had we been as free from all sins as from gluttony and drunkenness, we might have been canonized for saints. So, like, basically, we were so hungry. We were so far from gluttony. If that had been the case with all of our sins, then, um, you know, we were the most holy people in the world. So he finds some humor even in um, this situation. But he does talk about how many people died. Um, Fifty people died just from illness and from starvation. And so it was. It was a really rough time. Um, if you look at the top of page 114, however, the Indians did share provisions. Um, and their relationship with the Indians, it, it goes back and forth. Like sometimes it's hostile, sometimes it's good. And that's that's pretty, that's just kind of how it goes with the white folks in general in this early time in America. Now the thing I really want to draw your attention to is if you had to pick a main character in this story, who would it be? And if you read it, and this might have been a little confusing, because the narrator is John Smith, but he also talks about himself in the third person, which is, I think, really funny. Um, so look at page 114, about halfway down, that paragraph in the middle. So he writes, 
the new president, Ann Martin, being little beloved of weak judgment and dangers and less industry and peace, committed the managing of all things abroad to Captain Smith, who by his own example and good words and fair promises set some to mow, others to bind thatch, some to build houses, others to thatch them, himself always bearing the greatest task for his own share, so that in short time, he provided most of them lodging, neglecting any from himself. So the way he writes about himself is basically like, I'm awesome, and I'm providing for all of these lesser idiots in the village, and, you know, I'm very sacrificial. So he, he's all the things except for humble, really. And um, so we have to ask ourselves, because he's painting himself in this light, is this true to history? Can we rely on Smith as a reliable narrator? And that's one of the big questions of, you know, historians everywhere. We can't verify what really happened there. All we have is this, this document. So we're kind of at Smith's mercy, but unfortunately, the way he writes it makes it hard for us to believe, you know, how much of this was true. Um, let me give you a couple other examples of why we may think Smith as an unreliable narrator. Um, look at page 116. So this is where they get um, attacked by Indians while they're out on like a discovery expedition and Smith gets captured. So middle of page 116, listen to this. So, you know, some of his other people have been killed. So Smith, little dreaming of that accident, being got to the marshes at the river's head, 20 miles in the desert, had his two men slain, as is supposed, sleeping by the canoe, whilst himself, by fowling, sought them victual. So he's trying to find, you know, hunt birds. Who, finding he was beset with 200 savages, two of them he slew, still defending himself with the aid of a savage his guide, whom he bound to his arm with garters and used him as a buckler, which just means a shield. Yet he was shot in his thigh a little and had many arrows stuck in his clothes, but no great hurt, till at last they took him prisoner. So he's like, I was attacked by 200 savages, but I tied one to my arm and used him as a shield. And I was able to kill these other guys and all these arrows were stuck in me, but I was okay. It was no big deal. So that, again, it just seems very dramatic. And the fact that he's painting himself as this valiant hero um, makes us question his reliability and in the very next paragraph so they, they end up taking him prisoner it says um, six or seven weeks those barbarians kept him prisoner many strange triumphs and conjurations they made of him yet he so demeaned himself which means he just so de behaved himself amongst them as he not only diverted them from surprising the fort but procured his own liberty and got himself and his company such estimation among them that those savages admired him more than their own, I'm not going to try and say that word, um, basically their, their own idols that they worshipped. So he's like, I'm just so awesome and I behaved in such a way that they, I earned their respect and I kept them from attacking my people and I gained my own liberty. And um, so it does lead us to question just the re reliability of his narration. And I think there's a lot of humor to be had in here when they talk about how they kind of, um, the Indians would lead him around and he'd be like, it took nine men to hold me down and all this stuff and how they were all amazed at him. And um, it's, it's just kind of, it's a little humorous. <coughs> and something about this, I think we can say there's a lot of foreshadowing of the American voice in Smith's um, just portrayal of his adventures. And that is something we value in America. Um, we value a larger than life hero, right? We like someone who can beat the odds and someone who is just um, a really capable leader. And I think it's also part of the American voice to maybe have that bit of self-inflation. Um, we see that a lot in our culture, people who inflate themselves. Um, I can't help but think of Kanye, who one of his famous quotes is that his his greatest regret in life is that he's never gotten to hear himself live in concert. It's like, oh my gosh, come on. So, 
you know, it's, it started early in America, this uh, self-focus and self-inflation. And then the Native Americans, I just wanted us to discuss a little bit. So, um, you know, eventually he's able to, to trade with them and give them gifts and, you know, they let him go and all this stuff. Um, but I want you to see very early on that Smith's treatment and just the, you know, the colony in general, they were nice to the Native Americans when it benefited them, but they also used them when it benefited them. So, so it went both ways. Um, it was, it was a very troubled relationship and sometimes they were able to work well together and there was sharing of resources but sometimes they abused one another and I would say probably significantly more so on um, the white man's part abusing the Native Americans and using them um, to their advantage which obviously is not good. So that's really all I had to point out about the history of Virginia. Um, I do think that his description of being saved by Pocahontas is just, again, um, something to inflate his own view of himself or others' view of himself. I really doubt that that is true. So let's move on to a description of New England, which I just had you read a few pages out of this. And just a couple things I want to point about this. Smith describes the New World as a place of infinite possibility. He... um. I'll read this quote on page 124. He talks about the fish, right, and how, how many fish there are. So about six lines up from the bottom of page 124, he says, um, And is it not pretty sport to pull up two pence, six pence, and twelve pence as fast as you can haul and veer a line? He is a very bad fisher that cannot kill in one day with his hook and line one, two, or three hundred cods which dressed and dried, if they be sold there for 10 shillings, the hundred, though in England they would give more than 20, may not both the servant and the master and merchant be well contented with his main gain. If a man work but three days in seven, he may get more than he can spend unless he will be excessive. So basically painting America as a land of plenty and, you know, you can catch, catch 300 fish in a day and make all this money and there are just so many natural resources. So, which you can kind of decide for yourself if this is truthful. And he does, he's a, he's a great persuader. And I want you to see at the beginning, one of the rhetorical strategies he uses is these rhetorical questions, which um, I think were probably quite effective because so many people did come to the New World. But if you look at the very beginning on page 122, he says, Who can desire more content that hath small means or but only his merit to advance his fortune than to tread and plant the ground he hath purchased by the hazard of his life? So like, how could you want more than to work your own land and, you know, be, make something of yourself? And he talks about how, um, basically making people think about like, well, what could be better than building my own world and being part of a new world? And he even talks about, um, let's see, if you have any grain of faith or zeal in religion, what can he do less hurtful to any or more agreeable to God than to seek to convert those poor savages to know Christ and humanity? So, like, what better thing can you do than to spread Christianity to the new world? Um, what so truly suits with honor and honesty as the discovering things unknown, erecting towns, peopling countries, informing the ignorant, reforming things unjust, teaching virtue and gaining to our native mother country a kingdom to attend her, finding employment for those that are idle because they know not what to do. So basically like, like what better use of your life than to build this new world? Um, so I was kind of asked my students, like, do you think this was truthful? Do you think this was effective? If I think particularly to younger people, if you heard this message about this place you could go, where you could pretty much do whatever you wanted. You could pursue any occupation. It wasn't dependent on your parents. It wasn't dependent on your wealth. It was only dependent on your choice and your hard work. And so, and I think there is some truth that that is how, I don't think this was necessarily just him trying to manipulate people. This is how he really saw the, the new world as a place of infinite possibility. But 
there definitely is a little skimming over of, of how difficult it was. And, you know, in these first years, half the people who came there died um, from the elements, from the lack of civilization, um, just being in this new situation. So, you know, how truthful was it? you know, not really sure how effective was it. I think it was very effective because people read this and it, they were persuaded and enticed to come and, um, you know, seek a new adventure in a new land. So that's John Smith and I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>